Hello, everybody. This is John Blank, Chief Equity Strategist and Economist at Zach's Investment Research. Uh, we're doing a talk today about a primer for the semiconductor industry. Uh, this is a key supply shortage right now. It's a global industry, and it's also just received a big package from the government, the CHIPS Act of 2022. We're going to get through all of this today. If we can, uh, if you can't get a hold of these slides, it's probably not worth your time. You really need these slides. This is detailed material. So please call Saxon Professional Services to get these slides after the talk. Our disclosures as are, are as usual. This are, these are the views of me, John Blank, PhD, not the views of Zach's investment research and past performance is no guarantee of future results. Like I said, today we're going through a primer for investing in the semiconductor industry. First part, we'll go through the simplifying of the complexity of the industry. Do my best for you. Number two, we'll get into the global dimensions, which typically are both supply chain and government incentive related. Incentives are global now, and they're very major in this industry. Um, number three, we'll get through the Zacks metrics for the last 10 years in the major semiconductor industries. We'll go through them in detail. I'm going to leave you a story of the cycles and the profits and the interactions amongst these different groups at the industry level. So let's get going. First off, simplifying the complexity of the semiconductor industry. It's absolutely critical for us to even begin to discuss this industry to understand what it does. And this is not a subject for most people. Um, they get scared, their eyes glaze over. So let's try our best to not do that. Let's try and understand what we can learn at a high level about how this industry really works. So first off, let's get through some of the simple facts of the industry. Number one, uh, advances in manufacturing are phenomenal. Look at this 1970 to 2020. This is over the last 50 years in manufacturing process nodes. It used to take 10,000 manufacturing processes, 10,000. Then it went to 800, then it went to 90 every 15 years or so. Now we're down to seven. And as a result of simplifying the manufacturing processes, we lowered the cost per transistor, transistor just dramatic. So as we simplify the manufacturing processes, we lower the cost per transistor. And at the same time, the clock speed and the number of transistors that are on or in a microprocessor have improved. So the actual microprocessor is improving manufacturing processes is getting simpler and the cost is going down. Now, in order to do the look down here, this is the percent of R&D, US R&D spending in this process. It used to be 10% 20 years ago. We spent 10% of the cost of doing all this in R&D. Now we're up to almost 45%. So this is the story here. You must invest in R&D. Now over here, we've got a really interesting chart. This is what the US is better at doing. This is U.S. better than other countries. This is what the U.S. is worse at doing. These are the types of things that are, are of low importance to the industry. These are things that are of higher importance to the industry. So the U.S. is worse than other countries that at low impact things like capital spending and supporting infrastructure. This is where it's not as good as. In truth, also the government incentives and the labor costs, which are more important. U.S. is also not as good at. So this is the area where the CHIPS Act takes in place. We had to improve our government incentives because we have such a weak position on labor costs. Now, the United States does have strong advantages outside of the rest of the world. First of all, there's some ease of doing business and geopolitical considerations are actually not that important. We hear a lot about them, but they're not really what makes the United States critical. Up here are the three things that make a difference. Synergies with the ecosystem, the footprint. There's just a lot of stuff you have to do and keeping it together makes sense. The United States has the talent and the synergies of the ecosystem. Second and third is security, the intellectual property assets. Security is the other thing we can get in the United States that other countries don't have. So again, let's go through the really big benefits here. The synergies of the ecosystem and the footprint. Access to talent. This is an R&D intensive business, particularly in the United States and the security of the intellectual property that talent creates in the assets. 
All of this is key for the United States and these government incentives, labor costs kind of work against us that are critical. And that's why we have the CHIP Act right here. We need to improve this, put it over in that category. Now down here is an interesting one. This is end use of semiconductors during COVID-19. So this is the end use category, you know, computers, your phone, you know, consumer, I guess that's a set top box of cable. There's your, you know, the cat machine now are all automated automobiles, of course, are completely chip related and actually the government. But what I want to point out here is that the growth was largely during the COVID was in computers, and frankly, industrial. Kind of interesting. These are probably the numbers you want to focus on here in this chart of just the relative sizes of these niches, end use niches. And just point out the computers, the phones, and these other industries, these are kind of the five big ones. The government's not that much. But all together, this is the story of what this industry has done. It's dynamic, it's cost driven down, and it's global. And the United States has advantages and disadvantages. That's what you should be taking away from the slide. Okay. High degree of manufacturing complexity and ubiquity, meaning it's everywhere. So this slide is a very, very noisy slide. You need to get this, like I said, study it carefully and read through it carefully. I'll point out some big, big points for you to understand. <clears throat> Number one, design metrology, materials quality metrology, fab metrology, and wafer package metrology. Metrology is a subject we're gonna get in the next slide, but the point here is, at every stage of this process, you have to do some really close inspection and measurement of things. For example, the design metrology, this is material and device models for physical measurement of the mask and circuits of an integrated ship. Then over here, you have the supply of materials for these ships. Materials quality metrology, making sure those things have acceptances and testing for defects, purity, and other properties. So just on the back end in the wafer fabrication area, there's two metrologies. There's a design metrology and a materials quality metrology. And then of course, getting your materials and doing the chips. So here's where wafer fabrication, this would be your land research or type people. Um, what that happens here, just to notice, this goes 40 to 100 times. And there might be 2000 steps here, 40 to 100 times, 2000 steps. And again, in the midst of it is inline metrology, inspecting for defects on the wafer and the film and all these other things that have to be a testing density, surface charge analysis, dimensional examples, fine patterns. All this has to be done. And the process goes through deposition, lithography to etching. So just think about it. You put something down then you put a little picture of it and then you etch it and you do it over and over again. And in this process, just like before, you have a metrology, an outside entity that has to follow and study to see how this is doing. Just like here you have design and metrology, material supply and materials metrology. Here you have fab metrology. Then you get down here to the actual making of chips and goods. Again, this goes through testing, packaging, testing again, and the end products. And so this has Wafer and package metrology. This is called inline metrology. I mean, you put it in the actual process itself of inspection and testing. So this has to be going on, on and on and on. So you can see what we get out of it is just an amazing array of sectors that benefit here. I, I can go through them all here. I've got light vehicles, aerospace, military systems, medical devices, internet, financial system, computers, GPS tracking, energy, lighting, personal entertainment, appliances, public safety, just an amazing array. So keep this slide in mind here and understand that we've got some work to do about this thing called metrology. So what is metrology? Metrology is the study of measurement and it is the key to achieving accuracy. The aim is to provide accurate and therefore reliable measurements for trade, health, safety, and the environment. It is especially important in precision engineering, like what we're talking about, where products need to meet strict tolerances. Inline measurement suggests that the measurement dive or sensors are in a flow through system. So this is a chip process, a flow through system. Such a sensor integrated into a manufacturing kind of continuously monitor parameters passing through the station. So these are little station sensors that people put in typically by actually, by the way, the government. 
National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. Probably not a top of mind federal agency, right? Uh, again, I had never heard of the National Institute of Standards and Technology until I looked into this metrology and the story of these chips and the wafers and the etching and everything else. And what you learn is that NIST's activities are organized into lab programs that concentrate on nanoscale technology, engineering, info technology, neutron research, material measurement, and physical measurement. So it's highly science related. This always was not the case. From 1901 to 1988, this initiative was called the National Bureau of Standards. For those of us who don't play the game in this inter inter area, this would be, you know, making sure a gallon of gas is a gallon of gas at the pump. You can see the little National Bureau of Standards, you know, certificate at a pump. That's kind of what it used to do. So now they changed in 1980 to the National Institute of Standards and Technology. This group did the study of the World Trade Center in 2001. It also did the Surfside Condo Collapse. They sent the engineer down to look into the study that the materials that caused the collapse of those two buildings. In 2019, NIST launched a program called NIST on a chip. And this decreased the size of instruments from lab machines to chip size. So again, they were in the process of improving their own inline metrology for this business. And they started to get really into it in 2019. That's kind of the background of the 2022 chip act that we're going to talk about. And IST is headquartered in Gaithersburg, Maryland, outside of DC. It has a facility in Boulder, which was initiated, by the way, by President Eisenhower in 1954. So in 2010, they realigned and reduced to six laboratories. These are key. We're going to need to understand these very carefully communications technology, engineering, information technology. Center for Neutron Research, Material Measurement, and Physical Measurement. So these are kind of your back end stuff. These are more your front end stuff. Let's go on. Role of NIST. It's a noisy chart. Like I said, you've got to get a hold of this. This is going to go through the types of metrology, physical, computational, virtual, and et cetera. These are giving you the strategy of these, these groups. And I think this is probably where you want to focus. This is the grand challenge of these groups and what they do. And surprisingly, for all this noise of this slide, the one thing I found most interesting is just using these pictures. These pictures are very helpful. For example, metrology for materials purity property of government. This is a picture of an atom and a molecule. So that's that was neutrons and the things like very nanoscale stuff. Advanced technology for microelectronics. You can see that little machine etching away on the face of a chip. Here, you've got enabling metrology for integrated components. And you can see here, they're integrating the components and chip is getting wired in. Down here, modeling and simulating symptom and materials, designs and components. Here, you're actually putting it all into a design, right? You're stacking the chips, you're putting them into a configuration. Down here, you've got manufacturing processes. You can see this is kind of a picture of what you're gonna actually make of a given good. This is standardizing materials processing and engineering. So this is like giving out certificates for engineers to do various types of things. And down here, you've got security and microelectronics based components. So security, as we learned, it was a United States strength and we have developed it partly through the NIST. So this is very interesting. Use, use these pictures to your advantage. This is the way to simplify and then work your way into the detail. Okay, Chipsec. And sciences. First of all, I want to point over here that the Department of Energy, the NIST, and the National Science Foundation are involved in this. It is going to give $50 billion in R&D manufacturing and workforce incentives. So those were our weaknesses, remember. And from that $39 billion, so basically 80% is a manufacturing incentive. The other $13 billion goes to R&D workforce. So it's really a manufacturing incentive driven thing. But it has these other things that you can look into as well. But what I want to point out here is this is really going to be driven by the Department of Energy, Office of Science, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and the National Science Foundation. Okay, let's move on. Global dimensions. This is a global business. We must understand this. But first off, I want to point out the purchasing Producer price index for semis, that's up on top here. Again, you can see that it's going down. 
that's what the story of this industry is all about. And you're seeing that right here. That is the story of this industry. Producer price index has been going up, particularly, you know, up until the middle of COVID, uh, it was going down. Now you can see that it actually went up recently. That's fairly, you know, that's the supply chain shortage issue, and that's the material shortages. So this is the inflation back end for the semis. Import price index. This is uh, things that we're doing to bring them in. And, and I just want to show you this is capacity of utilization. The import price index is largely following along with the story above here about the PPI. You can see that in general, it was going down until basically December 2020, and then it started going up because of the, the uh, supply chain reductions and issues with trying to get a hold of all this stuff with the ports. I assume this is going down. But you can also see here what we need to understand is capacity utilization. This is critical. Every time this industry gets up to 80 per 5 percent capacity utilization, then it overbuilds and it comes back down to basically 75 percent. So this is the story of the cyclicality of this business. And again, like you can see here, there's now a story of declining uh, capacity utilization because it's probably in another cycle. We'll see that in the industries themselves. Down here at the bottom, we've got the semiconductor level. All I want to point out is this is 130% in 2019 levels. This was 100, this went to 130. So this has been growing basically 10% a year within the industrial production. It's a very stable pattern. So this is the growth. You know this business is going to be here, 10% growth on average at the industrial production macroeconomic level. All right, now we got to get back into some more terminology. TCO, total cost of ownership. Um, total cost of ownership is a very critical thing. I just want to point out the basic thing is it's about the expenses associated with purchasing the chip or the fab or the process or the product, deploying it, using it, and then retiring it. So it's this entire sequence of activities, purchasing, deploying, using and retiring. That's the total cost of ownership. Ownership is just buying. Total cost of ownership is buying, deploying, using, and retiring. So it's the initial purchase price plus the cost of operations across the lifespan of the asset. This is a more accurate way to determine value than ROI. So you guys hear total cost of ownership a lot in this type of business because you do have to do purchase, deploy, use, and retire these types of products. This is a very different concept than just buying it. Keep that in mind. All right, value added. So again, we're looking at here, semiconductor sales on average are 7% or so a year. You can see that nice move from 150 billion in 2002 to basically 450 billion. So this tripled the industry in the last 20 years. Phenomenal growth. Tripling the industry in 20 years. Um, market shares. The United States is half this business. Um, there's no other way to point out that the United States is half this business. Now down here, R&D spending as a percent of sales. Notice also the United States spends heavily, much more heavily than anywhere else in the country on R&D. This is the other thing that we talked about, the science footprint, the talent here, the, the nodes, the environment, the foot, this is all why the United States drives. Now, over here, we're going to get into the value added by activity and region in 2019. It goes from the R&D intensive, the CapEx intensive, down to the labor intensive. So this is, as you might expect, the blue is the United States. And we're very, very critically engaged at the R&D intensive levels. We're very much a big part of the value added story here. And we get less and less all the way down. We're only 2% of the labor story. 2% of the labor story, 75% of what's called the EDA, Exploratory Data Organization. And there's logic. And then DAO, I might point that out, it's the Centralized Autonomous Organization. So EDA and DAO and memory and logic, you probably don't know those names, manufacturing equipment. This is, as you can see, where we put our time and energy into these processes. CapEx and labor, less and less. CapEx, to some degree, is really a Taiwanese thing. You can see that. And then down here, you have CapEx and labor and so again, Taiwanese or Chinese, because they probably work together and across that street and developing and keeping the cost down from a labor cost perspective. Great, interesting stuff here. Keep it all in mind. 
and we will go on. All right, this is kind of a noisy chart. Uh, what I want to point out here is a couple things. Number one, uh, the, the total cost of ownership accounts for 40 to 70 percent in terms of government incentives. That's all I really want to point out here. Government incentives directly account for 40 to 70 percent of U.S. total cost of ownership. Just stop and breathe. Here's the 40 to 70 percent for logic, memory, and analog. You can see these are the numbers 40 to 70 percent right down here. And you can see this is related to what we do versus what other people do. So the point is 40 to 70 percent of TCO, of the gap, 40 to 70 percent of that gap is U.S. incentives. And that is obviously much bigger for logic and memory than it is for analog. So what do people do that's different than us? First off, I just point out, let's look at just China itself. One of the major things that China does, along with giving you 100 percent of the land, they give you two thirds of the construction of the facility and a third of the equipment. They also give you a huge cut on the corporate taxes, unlike us. We do a lot of work at state and property tax reductions. We do some work on land. This is how we do it. It's very much a different model. This is around 10 to 15 percent of the overall expense. China will be 30 to 40 percent. So this is, even though they have labor intensity, you got to also factor in the incredible amount of incentives. Like, again, let's go through it. Total cost of ownership is 25 to 50% higher in the United States. So we have to use incentives because we have a TCO that's 25 to 50% higher. The only way we do that is through incentives. So if you have fabs in the United States, if you want to make chips in the United States, it's going to be 25 to 50% higher. You must use incentives. That's why we did this package. All right. So do you, do you want to do this stuff or not? First of all, let's put on the private R&D spending is now 0.2% of GDP. It used to be you know, about almost 0.1. So it's 20 times as much. Still a very fractional thing in the economy. Probably cannot see it. But the dollar impact over here is dramatic. I just want to point out here that if you do a tripling of investment, or a doubling of research, you will add $160 billion in GDP, 500,000 jobs in 2029, and maintain our leadership. This little story here is the story. You get a huge bang for your buck out of this stuff. Even though private R&D is spending is huge, it's really critical to incentivize it because of its impact on R&D. That's what you should pick away from this chart. Okay. So now let's get into these final industries and let's talk about the investor metrics for these various groups. This will be well worth your time getting these slides for an investor perspective, and I will go through them fairly quickly. First off, let's just do the broad in electronic semiconductor and general semiconductor industries. This at the top is your PEG ratio and your price to East PE ratio for the electronics business. So it's about 16 now. The PEG ratio is very good for electronic semi. So that's the products, right? Basically. We're looking to buy the products pretty good here. A little different story here. Price to tangible book is come down dramatically for this industry. Nice entry point for the semiconductor general industry. And the PE ratio is basically the peg is 2.6. So from a peg perspective, uh, this industry is kind of pricey. From a price to tangible book perspective, it's not. Um, do I think this tells you something? I think it does. I think you've got to decide that you're buying actual earnings and the strength of these businesses versus, and you're just going to have to pay up for them. That's basically the story here. I think these do trend a little bit. Um, and I think that's what people are waiting for this to pull back, but it's kind of interesting to note that it's on very unlikely. If you look at this, the uh, dividend yields very low. They're using a lot of the cash in the business and the, uh, Adjusted free cash flow is also pretty low, 2.6%. But it, uh, let's go on. All right. So let's go into the memory and the power. This is memory. This is power. I just want to point out this green line here is your return on invested capital for power. So this really, the power group, semiconductor power. This is your servers. This is your Amazon Web Services and Azure and all these things that they're building out of these monster mega cap companies. Power. These things have been dramatic improvements. Over here, though, you see what people worry about. So return on invested capital for the memory business. 
Book value, of course, as we talked about, is just dramatic how much money these companies have on their books. They're making just loads of money. But the issue here is the return on invested capital. It's cycles. You make a lot of money, then your return to invest goes down, then you make a lot of money, and it goes down again. So this is the cycling, and you can see it takes basically two years to go down and two years to go back up, and two years to go down and two years to go back up. So are we at the top of the cycle here and on the way down? That's what's causing the market to worry right now. If you look down here, you know, here you've got a nice, interesting free cash flow margin. I don't really like this. What I like this down here is the enterprise value per share for the semi-power industries. You can see that we're really up nicely and enterprise value per share for the memory groups is also not as dramatically good, but, uh, but, but also giving you a nice entry point. So which do you want, the growth business or a nice entry point? It's really up to you. On we go to the fab founders and the wafer fabs. These are the guys who are making the stuff. Again, over here, you've got uh, capital spending, uh, dramatic, dramatic growth in this business. And over here, you've got capital spending wafer fabrication. Again, dramatic growth from 27. This is the land research applied sciences story. Uh, these are the huge, there's been a huge build out of this business. But down here, this is where we get in our free cash flow margins and over here, the gross margins. And again, you're looking at free cash flow margins that go up and down every two years. So it's again, cycling here at the family fab founder back end area. Not so much for these, these semi equipment players. This is actually not showing that. The semi equipment wafer fab looks to be a little stronger business, much like power. And I would keep that in mind. All right. So here we've got the analog and missing the discretes. Um, these are the, you know, your communication devices. Again, I, I would, I'll skip the discretes because I know very little about it other than to point out the time is discerned. And the growth in the, is in, is super strong. They're making money here in this type of business since 2020. It's been dramatic. Over here, I just want to point out again the cycle. You're seeing the cycle. And what we're seeing here, though, is return on capital at a high for the analogs, not a low. And uh, this is probably to be stayed away from because you can see that it's going down after a high. But I'd probably stay away from the communication device businesses. This is probably at high, I would focus more on these other businesses that we talked about. Again, we've got, make sure you understand the fab and equipment businesses, the memory groups and the power groups, electronics, semiconductors and the general industry, and then put them all together. There's basically eight groups and you can really learn a lot. So thanks for attending today. I hope you enjoyed this discussion critical industry, critical stories here, and hopefully some information you did not have available to you. Uh, we're gonna do another talk next time around on the actual companies using the Zacks ranks. We'll get a little more into the investing trading elements of this, but you really need this background to understand this business and the industry and the dynamics of the incentives and what the government's trying to do. I hope this was helpful. Please contact us at 866-794-6065. Send us an email at strategycall at zaxpro.com or get us on the web at www.zaxpro.com. We've also got stuff on the LinkedIn and Twitter, but I would focus here on a phone call. A phone call is always helpful, folks. 866-794-6065 or call you know, a sales force if you're someone who, who already subscribes to us or send us an email. That's also quite easy to do. Once again, I hope you enjoyed my talk today. Uh, critical industry, critical stuff. And I think we have stuff in this PowerPoint package that is nowhere else for you to find in one place. Thanks much.